Hello and welcome to this data visualization best practices video. My name is Alan. I'm a business intelligence and analytics consultant at Thorogood, based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about Thorogood and what we do, then give some context and explain the basic theory behind data visualization, and then finally get into some tips and best practices that you can use to create better visualizations in your dashboards and reports. So Thorogood is a consultant firm specialized in BI and analytics. We're a global company with offices in the UK, the US, Brazil, India, and Singapore. And we help our customers define and implement their BI analytics and data strategies. We design and deliver end-to-end -end solutions all the way from data sourcing, data transformation, to data visualization, and more advanced analytics. We also offer services like data as a service, user training and empowerment, and maintenance and support of applications. As a company, we have a very strong focus on business understanding in order to ensure that every project brings real value to the business of our customers. And to do so, it's really important to bring these three things together, analytics, technology, and focus on the business. In terms of technology, we are independent and can offer services across a range of different technologies and platforms. We have partnerships with a lot of the key players in the BI and analytics space like Microsoft, AWS, Databricks, and Tableau. And this independence is important because it means we are able to advise and implement solutions leveraging technology that best fits the needs of our client. Okay, let's get started. The definition of data visualization can be as simple as the visual representation of data, meaning we can use a lot of visual elements, not just text and numbers, to communicate to someone, a reader or a user, what the data is showing. Data visualization has been around for a long time and it has different applications. The most common, I'd say, is in journalism. We see charts and shapes showing data everywhere in magazines, TV, infographics on the web. Academia is another very important application, and it's where you see a lot of the more complex charts and visuals, which are intended to audiences that are going to do very detailed analysis. You publish a study on a paper and choose visualizations to help present your findings. By the way, this is where the whole field of data science came from. It started in academic environments. And finally, BI, which is what we're going to focus on. In BI, you use data visualization to keep track of your business in the form of reports and dashboards. Every department in a data-driven organization has a lot of metrics and goals that need to be monitored and interpreted every day so people can make well-informed decisions. There are different levels of complexity in these metrics, a lot of data sources, many comparisons that can be made, and quite a few different groups of users, each with different needs. So overall, it's a very dynamic environment. In these two applications on the left, the visualizations are usually formatted to be presented only once. But in BI, your numbers keep changing all the time. So you have to make sure your charts behave well when the new data comes in. And it's important to know here that within a company, there are three basic types of analysis that a report or a dashboard can help you with. And depending on the goal of the analysis, you're going to use visualizations in different ways. You can do an exploratory analysis, which is when you don't have your questions ready. You're going to play around with your data in a visualization tool like Tableau or Power BI to understand the data better and see if you find any pattern that can lead to an insight. You can do a descriptive analysis, which is going to answer your day-to-day -day business questions or help you diagnose or describe something that's happening and that your data is telling you. Here's where you find the, the periodic reports of multiple teams, which can be daily, weekly, monthly, and also some isolated ad hoc reports. Finally, you can use also visualization to help you explain something. After you've analyzed and interpreted your data, you can create visualizations to help you tell a story, add comments, and prove a point. This is usually done on PowerPoint presentations, but you can also use data visualization tools to do it. And all of these types of analysis together 
are going to help people make better informed decisions within companies. So what makes a good dashboard? What's the best way to tell if a dashboard or a report is successful? Well, if we're talking about BI inside an organization, the answer is very simple, adoption. Your dashboard can be very pretty, very informative, but if no one's using it, or if people are always wanting to export the data back to Excel, then we can say your dashboard hasn't really served its purpose. So here I want to take a step back and uh, talk not just about visualization, but about other things you need to have so people actually use your dashboards. First of all, they need to be reliable. Your numbers need to be right. Even if the underlying data is not your responsibility, if your, num if your numbers are wrong, people will say that your dashboard is wrong. So you need to really understand the data being used and the calculations that are being done behind it. Your dashboard needs to have good performance, both in the data refresh, which can usually be done overnight, and also during navigation, which is when the user open, uh, opens the report or clicks on a filter. It shouldn't take more than a few seconds to respond. And for that, you need to have a good solution architecture and a very good data model behind everything. The communication needs to be clear. And here's where a good use of visualizations come in. And we're going to get into more details. Usability of or user experience. This means things being well organized, a nice navigation flow between pages, interactions between charts, etc. And to achieve that, you need to understand each user. The same data set can generate different dashboards for different users. Executives, for example, need to see very high level data, usually don't want to spend much time clicking around to get to their answers, while analysts generally go into a lot more detail. But overall, in order for a dashboard or report to be adopted, the information it gives needs to have business value. So you, as the report maker, always need to understand the business objectives. And if they change, the report needs to change as well. So how does it work? Well, first you need to think, why do we use charts, diagrams, shapes, and colors? It's because our brains are much faster at processing visual information than just plain text. And all of the tips I'm going to give here are based on that. When you create something, you have to think, how are people's brains going to react to what I'm showing here? So here's a little exercise. I invite you to pause this video right now and count how many times the number five appear here on the screen. Is it five? Six? Easy to find? Now I'm going to make a small change and you tell me if it makes it any easier. It does, right? So what did I do here? I changed a couple of visual elements, in this case, the width of the font, making it bold, and the color. And that made your brain find the number much faster. So these are some of the visual elements that your brain will use to differentiate data points from each other. We have length, width, orientation, size, shape, enclosure, or having something around a few of the data points, the position, which is what you see in the axis of a line chart or a scatter plot, for example, grouping, and color, which you can break down further into things like hue, saturation, brightness, amount of red, green, and blue, etc. And using those elements, I can guide your eyes to look at where I want you to look. So for a big sales KPI that you're going to see every day, what's more important, the number or the title? The number, because the title you're going to memorize eventually. So highlight the number. This is another example. Look at these four data sets. They all have the same mean and standard deviation of both X and Y. So if you look at them, it's really hard to tell how different they are. But when you put these data sets in plots, you can see that the data has a very different pattern in each of them. So this is just to highlight the importance of charts. 
Surprisingly, a lot of people still have trouble trusting charts and still insist on having a lot of tables in their reports. Maybe the reason is that they've always been given really poor charts, or it's just a cultural adaptation that needs to happen. In any case, if that's a problem in your organization, it's definitely something we can help with. All right, so let's apply these principles and get into some tips and best practices of data visualization. One important thing to understand is the function of axes and labels. They both exist to give a number value to data points of different sizes. In this case, we're using bar charts. The point is, if they both serve the same purpose, you only need one of them. So in the chart on the right, we've made a few improvements. One, we've removed the X axis because we're keeping the labels instead. Two, we've simplified the labels by dividing them by a million and putting an M next to them. This makes it clear since those dollars at the end may not matter that much when we're looking at data that's so aggregated. Three, we've removed the title of both axes. The X axis, number of users, is already indicated in the title, total users in 2019. And in the Y axis, if you look at the values, they're obviously names of countries. If you work looking at a chart by country every day, you don't need to be reminded that those are countries. This saves a lot of space in your screen. And remember, having enough white space is just as important as having information there. So it helps your brain look at what, what really matters. So speaking of saving space on your screen, here's something else you can do. On the left here, we have the y-axis repeating the euro values in the scale 11 times. You have the currency symbol, a dot, three zeros, a comma, plus two zeros at the end for each value. In the chart on the right, we've changed the title so it says that the values are in thousands of euros, stating that only once and then making the numbers on the axis a lot simpler, just going from zero to 10. This also saves a lot of space and makes it easier to read. Another best practice is around the user color. We often find ourselves adding a lot of color to our visualizations, trying to make it look nicer, maybe not as bland. But if you think about the visual elements, in this bar chart at least, you can see that the product categories are already distinguished by position. You have one bar for each category, so why would you need to differentiate them again by giving each of them a different color? If I see that, I go looking for a legend, thinking that each color means something different, but that's not the case here. So here, sticking to just one color is a better idea, unless you're using that color association in other places throughout the dashboard. This example is to help us think about the right type of chart to use. We could talk about many different chart types here, but I'm gonna stick to just a few today because the general principle is the same, which is to think about how your brain is gonna tend to perceive the information. So in this line chart on the left, the tendency is to read from left to right. This gives an idea of movement, as if the data categories were, were changing in this direction. But that's not the case, and, and that's why a bar chart is better. Keep the use of line charts for when there's a logical sequence in the data, like something changing over time. Another example about chart types. In data visualization, there's something called the case against pie charts. Pie charts have been very common in the past, even those weird 3D ones, but now they're not used as much. There's nothing wrong with them, but you have to use them very carefully, and, and here's why. If you look at this chart on the left, in order to see what's the category corresponding to each slice, you need to do quite a lot of movement with your eyes. So green slice, legend, okay, consumer. Next one, corporate, and so on. It's quite a zigzag. Also, which one is bigger, the green one or the gray one? It's hard to tell. And you have to look at the, uh, the labels and then compare the numbers. And that's with only four slices. Imagine if you have 10 or 15. 
So making some changes on the right side, we have the same data, but as a bar chart. It doesn't look as colorful, but it's a lot easier to read. You can rank the bars by value. You can see the amounts using the labels. And you can add an average line if you want. In this case, it's obviously 25% because it's four slices. But you can see that the top category accounts for between 30 and 40% of the sales. And your eyes don't need to move as much to make sense of this data. One last thing about the use of color. Suppose you have these two charts on the same screen. Can you tell if the sales on the left belong just to Brazil or to the whole company? It's hard to say. Because your brain will see the color and make that association, thinking that these sales correspond only to the country with that color. But that's not very clear here, so be careful not to use the same color in different places unless they actually mean the same thing. This tip is about the positioning of your visuals. At least in the Western Hemisphere, our brains tend to look at things following this order. You start on the top left corner and do a Z shape until you get to the bottom right corner. So when building a business dashboard, keep that in mind. You can place your most important, quickest to read macro level visual on the top left and your most detailed visual, a table for example, on the bottom right. If your user sees the first visual and it looks okay as expected, they can move on to the following page. If not, they can look at the other ones to understand what's, what's happening. And here's the most important tip, I think, which is to break down and prioritize. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples of this. So here we have a line chart showing the variance between your actuals and your budget over 12 weeks. You have three metrics, that is three numbers that you, your eye can spot for each week. The actuals, the budget, and the variance, which is the difference or distance between them. And you have one attribute, which is the week or time. With those metrics and attributes, you can create charts to picture four things. The budget over time, the actuals over time, the variance over time in absolute terms, in this case, euros, and also the variance over time in percentage terms, meaning what's the percentage difference between actuals and budget at each week. By creating a chart like this one, which of these four points is being communicated? Well, technically all of them. You have one line for the budget, one line for the actual. You can see the trend in each one. You can kind of see the distance between them at each week. And you can also look at the y-axis to see how much that means in euros. But none of that gives you a quick reading. It takes a bit of time to grasp what's going on. And in some data points, like between weeks three and six, it becomes a bit confusing. So this is where you have to prioritize. What do you want to show? What do you want to communicate and highlight? So suppose you've done that exercise and figured out that the most important thing to show to the user here is the variance between budget and actuals over time in percentage terms. Then you can modify the chart and you will need some changes in the calculations behind it in this case, and only display the variance. You fix the target in a straight reference line and only show the variance in percentage terms. Much simpler to read. You can see the ups and downs very clearly, ranging from minus 40% to plus 40%. If you go back to the previous chart and try to see those ups and downs, you'll see that it's pretty hard to grasp that, but in this one it's very easy. And here's our final example, on the same tip of breaking down and prioritizing. This is called a stacked column chart, you have the sum of units sold over six months by brand. In other words, you have two metrics that you can see, the, numbers of, the number of units sold and also the share of each brand inside each bar or each month. The attributes are then brand and month. So what can you try to show here? The total units sold over time, represented by the size of each total bar, and you can see an upward trend. The number of units sold over time in each brand. 
So you can figure that out by looking at the size of the slice in each bar and then looking at the y-axis to see how much that is. The brand share over time by looking at how the proportion of each slice of the bars changes over time. And the total brand share, which is kind of the average of the biggest slice in each month. Anyway, so this is a very rich chart. There's a lot of information you can get from it. But again, none of this information is very clear. It takes time to interpret it. Nothing jumps out. So now that we've broken down the things that we can communicate, let's prioritize something and then simplify. It. And I'm going to do I'm going to do that in two alternative scenarios. And this first one, suppose we've done uh, an exercise with the users and realize that we need to highlight the total units sold over time and also the brand share over time. So for total units, we're using a simple column chart. And for the share over time, we created a color table or a heat map. It's a table with the percentage values of each brand, totaling 100% in each column, which uses color to distinguish the smaller and the larger shares. With that, you can easily see that brand C has the most dominant share overall. You can see that brand D has a dip in month, months two and three, which can be analyzed further, and a few other isolated highlights. Coming from that same stacked column chart, this is another way of presenting it after prioritizing what to display. Here we chose to show the trend of units sold over time by each individual brand. And the total brand share considering the, the whole six month period. So we created some simple area charts where you can quickly see the trends and variations. And also added a total percentage share of the six months on the right side. What calls my attention first is that brand C has the highest overall sales also, there's that big dip in brand D for months two and three. And then by looking at their numbers on the right, you get a sense of the distribution of each brand over the whole period. So to summarize what we've seen, typically good visualizations in business intelligence and analytics systems have these following characteristics. They're simple and provide an efficient interpretation of the visuals which can help the users to understand what's happening and make decisions quicker. They're clean with little repetition, enough white space, and a screen that's not cluttered with information. They employ a wise use of each visual element like chart types, color, and text. And finally, they're very aligned to the business strategy and objectives. So everything you display is actually useful. Well, thank you. And I hope you enjoyed the content and examples that I brought here today. And feel free to get in touch if you have any questions or want to discuss this topic further.